statute miles over southeast Kazakhstan. The launch is precisely timed for the moment when the Earth's rotation will of the orbit of the, the International Space Station. The time of the Soyuz spacecraft's orbital insertion, about nine minutes after its initial launch, the ISS will be about 1,677 statute miles ahead as, they, as the rendezvous begins. The six-hour rendezvous will culminate with a docking to the International Space Station's Rosviet module, that coming at 8.48 p.m. Central Time tonight, 5.48 a.m. Moscow time and 7.48 a.m. in the morning tomorrow, uh, where Russian, American, and European dignitaries, guests, and family will be watching the events unfold. Should an issue occur in the first four hours of the flight, the Soyuz vehicle and its crew can default to a two-day rendezvous with the docking that would occur in the early evening hours central time on May 30th. Uh, just such a scenario unfolded back in March after the, uh, the launch of Steve Swanson, Alexander Skortsov, and Oleg Artemiev aboard their Soyuz TMA-12M spacecraft in which uh, an orbital adjustment burn did not occur as planned. Two-day rendezvous uh, began, and the three successfully docked to the International Space Station on March 27th. And so, like always, we spoke with the crew members before the flight about their upcoming expedition, uh, their careers preparing for the flight, and what they are most looking forward to. So we count down to launch just about 24 and a half minutes away now. Let's hear more from the crew in their own words. The new members of the International Space Station's Expedition 40 crew share an affinity for exploration on this planet, but they're also eager to take up the challenge of setting the stage for future exploration off the planet. Max Sarayev is the son of a Soviet Air Force officer. He was born in Chelyabinsk in the southern Ural region of Russia, north of Kazakhstan, but his family moved all over the country during his childhood. All along, he intended to become a military pilot, the idea of becoming a cosmonaut was just an extension of that idea. And I thought I'd give it a shot because uh, uh, the profession of uh, a military pilot is very similar to that of a cosmonaut. Making quick decisions, making right decisions, uh, something risky, something complicated, something challenging, something interesting, which brings uh, lots of pleasure if you manage. After high school in Noginsk, near Star City, Sarayev graduated from the Kasha Air Force Pilot School in the Crimea with a specialty in command tactical fighter aviation. Then he went to the Zhukovsky Air Force Academy to specialize in test and exploitation of aircraft and weapons systems. He applied to the Cosmonaut Corps and was selected the year before he finished at the Academy. And while training in Star City, he also graduated from the Civil Service Academy of Russia as a lawyer. Sarayev's first flight was a six-month tour on Expeditions 21 and 22 in 2009 and 2010, during which he completed one spacewalk. Although he retired from the Russian Air Force as a colonel in 2012, he continues to work for the cause of human space exploration. That's why we send humans in space, so that we move forward, that we may discover something in the future, maybe, maybe not in the uh, so near future, but discovering some new worlds, new planets, something that will help us develop and move forward. U.S. Navy Commander Reed Wiseman grew up in the suburbs of Baltimore, Maryland, far enough away from the city to be able to enjoy nature, learn about the world, and make the most of the freedom and encouragement he got from his parents. And they always had boundaries, but it was exploration from the time I was born, you know, going to the lake with my brother, uh, learning on my own and figuring things out, and, and they gave me that, that freedom, and it was wonderful. Wiseman earned a Bachelor's of Science in Computer and Systems Engineering and a commission in the Navy through the ROTC at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. After flight training, he was assigned to an F-14 squadron and made two deployments to the Middle East during operations Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. During the second deployment, he was picked for the Navy's test pilot school. And later, while working at the Patuxent River Naval Air Station, he also earned a master's degree in systems engineering from Johns Hopkins. Wiseman made two more international deployments before he was picked for the astronaut program in 2009 and got the chance to resume the exploration he loved as a child. 
We are curious, we are inquisitive, we are explorers by our very nature. And right now, the biggest exploration that a human can go on is 250 miles up on the space station. So to me, there's not even a question. Of course it's worth the risk. Uh, just to go out there and push humanity to further than we've been, that's, that's a no-brainer. Dr. Alexander Gerst was born in Kunzelsau, a small town in rural south-central Germany. He liked being close to nature and looking up at the night sky, and his curiosity was piqued when his grandfather talked to people all over the world on his amateur radio. One day he somehow managed to adjust his antenna such that it would actually broadcast to the moon. And uh, he gave me the microphone and let me speak a few words into the radio. They would bounce back from the surface of the moon and about two and a half seconds later I would hear my own words in the radio, knowing as a six-year-old that they were just on the moon. So it was impossible for me to grasp in the beginning. Gerst started his exploration focused on this planet and earned a diploma in geophysics from the University of Karlsruhe in Germany while also getting his master's in earth sciences from Victoria University in New Zealand while working there developing new volcano monitoring techniques. He made four scientific missions to study volcanoes in Antarctica while working on his doctorate in natural sciences at the Institute of Geophysics at the University of Hamburg. And during that time, he made good on a promise to himself that he would make at least one sincere effort to become an astronaut. He was selected for the Astronaut Corps by the European Space Agency in 2009, finished his PhD the following year, and has been focused ever since on his chance to be part of what he calls the first wave. Being the first, well, wave of explorers on the way out, exploring the universe uh, to moon, asteroids, Mars, and beyond. Uh, that is, for me, such an important thing to do for, oh, yes, the, for so humankind, for science. Or a source. Okay, anyway, back to Soyuz. And we're back now with a live view of the Soyuz on the launch pad in Baikonur. Right now, just 18 minutes, 37 eight, seconds eight, away eight, before the launch. Liftoff scheduled for 2.57 p.m. Central, 1.57 a.m. Baikonur. So right now, a group of NASA representatives are down there in Baikonur, just a short distance away from the launch pad. For a quick update on activities there, let's go now to NASA Public Affairs Officer Rob Navius. Dan, good afternoon and good morning from the Central Asian Desert on a warm morning here. Temperatures in the 70s, heading for a high near triple figures by the time the Soyuz vehicle that stands less than a mile from us docks to the International Space Station. NASA is represented here for the second Soyuz crew launch of the year by Bill Gerstenmeyer, the Associate Administrator for Spaceflight Operations and Deputy ISS Program Manager Dan Hartman. A huge contingent of European Space Agency officials are on hand, led by their Director General Jean-Jacques Dordain, as well as officials from the German Space Agency, DLR. After launch, we'll gather back in the town of Baikonur at a local hall, where a special NASA television feed will be set up, enabling us to watch docking and hatch opening, and for VIPs and family members to place congratulatory calls to the newly arrived crew members. Over the launch pad, starry skies. Off on the distant horizon, some flashes of lightning, but nothing to be concerned about on a perfect morning for launch. That's it for now from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Back to you at Mission Control in Houston. And thanks again, Rob. Still on track for that on-time liftoff today at 2.57 p.m. Central Time, 1.57 a.m. Baikonur Time, Another just under 17 minutes, so. minutes now from launch. During the climb to orbit, uh, tracking and telemetry is downlinked to ground stations along the flight path and is then routed to the launch control bunker near the launch pad in Baikonur and also to the Russian Mission Control Center just outside of Moscow. The flight is controlled uh, from the bunker until shutdown with a third stage engine when it's then transitioned over to the Russian Flight Control Center. You can see right here. 
Just seconds after the Soyuz reaches orbit, the vehicle's command and control systems will be activated. Stored commuter, computer commands uh, will deploy navigation and communications antennas along with the solar arrays uh, to begin collecting power for use by the onboard batteries in order to generate electricity for the Soyuz system.